always ask this. How many have never been here? Wow. I am always amazing. <laughs> you know, when you grow up here, and this is part of your family and part of your life, you assume everybody, including God, has seen this. But that's not true. So, um, this is the famed Forks of Cypress plantation song. And um, I was going to tell you a little bit. I've, I've had some questions about why the fence is here, etc., etc. Inside the fence is owned by the state of Alabama. It, this is a national preserved site, national heritage site. It cannot be altered in any way. It cannot, the house can never be rebuilt. The house and the site fell on really bad times after the fire. And the family members and I and others who are interested formed what was called the Forks of Cypress Preservation Committee and reached out to a family and relatives all over the country and some in Europe. And money began to come in and we raised $200,000. Uh, initially and that money very quickly went to preserve the columns you'll notice the columns have been repointed with mortar and then they have been topped with copper um, work began to repoint these columns preserve them by putting a copper top on to keep the moisture out of the columns and there are 20 there were originally 24 columns and you'll notice one is missing over there in the corner that happened the night of the fire. And um, lightning hit in this corner in a freak thunderstorm. I had just graduated from high school. That tells you how old I am. And uh, I had had a shower. We had animals down here in the barn. So I had been down that morning feeding. And, and so I got back home. It's about 9 o'clock. Got into the shower. Had just gotten out. And this thunderstorm blows up. And you, you know how the lightning pops and boom, boom, boom. A gentleman pulled up in the yard and blew the horn and said, that house is on fire. So he had come down the road and saw it. So my dad and I got in the car or truck and drove down here. And the, the, this is the dog trot, okay? This is the front of the house. The back door, our front door was here. The back door is exactly behind it back there. And we got there and the paint was already running down the door. That's how quick it caught on fire and how quick it was burning. So uh, had we opened that door, we probably would have been killed, the fireman said. So the house, and if you've ever seen the picture, the, the caramel olive picture of the house in flames, that's what it looked like in about 30 minutes. It was completely gone. Um, it was all timber frame and uh, brick and mortar, as you see, and literally just went up like a match. So. During the night, uh, we were afraid that there'd be looters come, so um, some police stayed, and some of, my, some of my friends and I stayed. And during the night, the four chimney, they had four big chimney, three of them collapsed within, and one collapsed without, and took that column with it. So that's why that column is missing, okay? It's never gonna be rebuilt, the house stays as is. So, uh, does that answer any questions? Uh, I guess this question needs to be asked. Why can't you just come in here anytime you want to? And the answer to that is the families that own the property outside this fence don't want you to. <laughs> they, have their hand, they have their horses here and their cattle. They were smart enough with the state when they negotiated with the state. The state gets this block, but the state does not get the right of way. So even the state people have to get permission from the families to get in here. And even the state people don't have a key. So that's how it's been done. And that was pretty smart on their part to, re to regulate who comes in, who comes out. All right, so uh, does that, we have any questions about that? Anybody have any questions that needs to be about that or why they're just not wholesale open? We have two tours a year. Uh, sponsored through the tourism and then I have a class at UNA um, on local history and sometimes we come here with the, the people in that class in fact I've uh, got a couple of students here tonight today with us so um, anything real quick all right so um,
today, Lauderdale County was part of the Alabama Mississippi territories in 1817. <clears throat> so the Indians had already ceded all their land in 1816. The government then assumed ownership. The government then began to uh, bring in surveyors, one of which was John Coffey, General John Coffey. Um, and another one very soon would be a man, an Italian named Ferdinand Sinona, who's famous in Florence. So the government hired the surveyors. The surveyors come out, they survey the land for the purpose of selling the land because the government is broke. We have fought the American Revolution we have fought the War of 1812, and we have no money. So in part, to pay their soldiers, they paid their soldiers with bounty land, land by rank and by service. In other words, the longer you served and the higher your rank, the more land you could get in the frontier. Huntsville has already been founded in 1816, and so Huntsville will become the headquarters of John Coffey and the surveyors who are surveying North Alabama. And they literally sent out in all directions surveying. Very quickly, there began to be companies formed to buy this land. Um, individuals that you couldn't go buy land like you would go some buy something at Walmart. Individuals could not buy the land, but companies could. So the companies would buy the land from the government, and in turn, the companies would sell you the land. That's how it was going to work. So very, very quickly, men from Tennessee, of which James Jackson, the owner of this property, and John Coffey and others saw an opportunity. So they had formed a company called the Tennessee Land Company. Now, these land companies only had one purpose, and that's to buy land and sell it at a profit. That's it. They're early real estate developers, if you will. And it was simply called land speculation. You're speculating that you'll buy it cheap and sell it high. An, uh, another company uh, that was founded in Huntsville was named the uh, Alabama Land Company. So all of this time, 1817, 1818, there began to be these companies popping up everywhere to take advantage of this open land, this new land, virgin land in Alabama territory. It was such a fever pitch, if you will, that it was called Alabama fever, literally. It caught, it's just like, a, this, just like COVID. It just caught on like a wildfire. And people all up the East Coast living on land that had long ago been worn out by repeated agriculture decided, let's go to Alabama. Buy land, cheap as we can, grow cotton. So Alabama fever caught on in 1818 when the land sales were started. So the first land sales were conducted in Huntsville. And the, the company, the, the company, Alabama Land Company and Tennessee Land Company decided we need to join forces because what we're doing is bidding against each other and driving price up. So they formed a third company called the Cypress Land Company. And it's the Cypress Land Company that bought the land Florence is on. So they bought the land in Florence, 5,500 and some odd acres, and bought it to develop the city of Florence. And that's how the Florence was laid out. James Jackson is a member of that company. And he had very good taste because he bought this site for his house. And um, Big Cypress Creek is over here to your right, and Little Cypress Creek is here to your left. And if you came this way, you crossed the bridge. Through the woods, directly behind me, is where the two creeks fork together. Thus the name Forks of Cypress. Okay, so we know from history that this land once belonged to the infamous Cherokee Chief Doublehead. The government gave him, gave him a reservation in 18, 18.2, I think, 18.1, at Blue Water Creek is where he was stationed, his headquarters. Now, listen to the dimensions. His land ran from Elk River in the east 
to Cypress Creek. From the Tennessee River, 10 miles inland. This is his. And anyone living here has to live here with his permission. So there were a number of white families living here at the Shoals, 185, 184, 1867. But every one of them living here were living here and paying rent to Doublehead. <laughs> so he's a landowner, he's a plantation owner, he's a businessman. Prior to that, he was one of the most savage Cherokees to have ever lived. But once he found out that he could make money and make money legit without stealing it, you know, he became a big businessman. He had a plantation out there. He had African slaves out there working his plantation. He had schools out there for the white children, the white families. He even had a Moravian church out there for the families. And they, they had to pay him in whiskey rent. Whiskey was a commodity other, just as good as any kind of money. So we know that he had a textile industry out there. He had a ferry. He built a road from Blue Water Creek to right near Franklin, Tennessee. And so you could cross the Tennessee River and his ferry, of course, that was a toll road. You had to pay him. So it's always been interesting to me, once a bloody savage who spoke no very, very little English, who could not read or write English, is now the leading businessman in the Muscle Shoals area in 1807, 18, Very, very interesting character. So after his death, the government gets the land back. Eventually the land is sold. James Jackson and their friends buy it. He, he bought, along with John Coffey and a couple of others, they bought over 5,000 acres together. Uh, this plantation at one time probably had, we think, uh, in excess of 2,000 acres. Um, at one time, they said that James Jackson could get up in the morning and saddle a horse and ride up one creek and then ride back and ride back down another creek and could not do that in one day. He owned that much land. So when he died in 1840, he was the richest man in Alabama. He served in both the state house and the state senate. And um, he was the president of the state senate when they moved the capital to Tuscaloosa from Cahaba. And in Tuscaloosa, he met a man named William Nichols, an engineer, uh, architect, if you would. And he, William Nichols, was employed to design the capital buildings in Tuscaloosa. And so he hired William Nichols to design his house. So with this is a home designed by William Nichols now, there's been a debate, and, and some of the family members, uh, Curtis Flowers, who's usually here, who has written a book on the horses, is not here. And some of the others, a couple, couple of them I know, have been ill lately. But one of the things we discussed among the family, and I'm not a descendant of the family. I'm just a descendant of the man who bought it in the 30s. So we, there's been a debate. Did the porch and the columns, was it original to the house? And there seems to be now, according to family letters, proof that this was added later. So if that's true, then the house, and you've seen pictures, was nothing more than a big triangular two-story box, a wooden box. So some have said that William Nichols actually designs this portico, the porch, the columns, etc. He designed houses all around Nashville, Franklin, Murfreesboro, even around Huntsville. So we know at the time that all this is going on, he was in, living in Madison County. So he designs the forks. He also is the architect, engineer, who was employed to design the first Muscle Shoals Canal around to get over the shoals. Uh, this was done in the 1830s, and it was not successful, but if you if those of you who have depth finders in your boats, you can get on, you know, on the river on the north side and follow the canal by simply your depth chart, your depth finder. It ran from Florence all the way up to Blue Water. So he, was, he designed the first canal, this William Nichols, 
and a very prominent architect engineer, if you would. So uh, backtracking a little bit, James Jackson comes to this property, bought, buys this property, at, we think during the first land sale, 1818, March of 1818. And the city of Florence is designed on paper in March of 1818. So it's, you see, we're way over 200 years old. So uh, the city is. So he, when he comes here, he finds this cabin down here. If you come in, you came in down here, you'll notice there's a limestone chimney. There was a cabin there. It's called a saddlebag cabin, meaning the chimney was in the center and two rooms were on each side, including a sleeping loft above. The cabin um, was unusual in the sense that Europeans particularly the Swedes, the Danes, the Scandinavians, they built their cabins with chimneys on the end. And you've seen that. But when the first whites came into the Tennessee Valley, they wrote in their letters back home, the Cherokees are living in log houses with a chimney in the middle. This is called a saddleback. So we feel very confident that that cabin perhaps was constructed by Doubleheads people. If that's so, archaeological evidence has, when, it was, when the cabin burned, and by the way, it was arsoned by a group of teenagers, they came back up the state, sent some archaeologists up here to prove or find out how old it was, and they carried it all the way back to 1810. So uh, this house is started in 1819, this house is. And so we know that Jackson moved his family from Nashville down here to this cabin in 18, somewhere in 1819 when this house was started. Uh, so there's been some controversy. Did they ever live there? Was it a slave cabin, et cetera, et cetera? But family letters now have surfaced that said actually the family lived in that cabin until this house was finished in 1822, thinking, we think the house was completed somewhere around February or March of that year. So, um, and then we think maybe a couple of years later, they added the columns and the porches all the way around. This is called peristyle, meaning that the, the porch encircles it. You have to go to Demopolis, and then you have to go to what they call Plantation Alley on the Mississippi River to find houses similar to this. We think this is the first house of this kind in the state of Alabama, what becomes the state of Alabama with this portico all the way around. Makes it a very stately house. Whereas if you just had the same, the plain block wood house, it was, would not be the same appearance. All right, so this is the front. You came through a, a road down there, but straight down in that corner, like at the cornfield. This road you came up did not exist at that time. This was Jackson's Road. It went all the way from Florence across and hit what is today Savannah Highway. Then that was called Hood's Road. The Hood family lived in a plantation down on the Waterloo Road called Woodlawn. And um, if my class takes at UNA, we're going to do a plantation tour later, and that'll be one of the houses we will go to. So. Um, and then right across the creek was Cypress Hill, another plantation that belonged to uh, other families. And by the way, John Coffey only lived about a mile through the woods right there. So Coffey, Jackson, um, I'm, I'm trying to come up with the name over here, and I'll get it in a minute, and then Hood. So there are four major plantations within five miles of each other. And no one lives between them because they own the, all the land. They own big blocks of property, if you would. So we know that Jackson is here. His first child was a girl named Sarah, born here at the Forks, or on the property. He had, he had originally come from Ireland, and he was the ninth child out of 10. And educated, he is not one of the Irish you've heard about in history of the potato famine. He's well educated at, in Dublin, and he is a civil engineer, which would be architect slash land surveyor, and um, comes to America, there's some, there, are, there are some questions about why he comes, but 
the majority of the answer is one thing. In Europe, they had a law called the law of primogenitor. And the law of primogenitor simply said, the oldest son gets the estate. So he's nine out of 10. The siblings, including the women, girls, got money to start a life. So Jackson's siblings, I know he had two uncles here in America, and he had an, uh, three brothers here in America and a couple of sisters, we know that. Many of them settled in Philadelphia first, then he migrated from Philadelphia to Baltimore, we think, for a while, and then from Baltimore he settled in Nashville. Now why Nashville? Nashville was the new town on the frontier and it was a boom town. Trade was coming all up and down the, the Tennessee Valley and Cumberland River Valley. And so he fell in very quickly with a group of men who were considered the Southern aristocracy. These guys were wealthy landowners, slave owners, crop, cotton, et cetera, shipping all the way to New Orleans and back, of which James Jackson, uh, John Coffey was one, and Andrew Jackson, future President Jackson. So that's the kind of people he runs with. And it's interesting that from the very beginning, we think he and James, Andrew Jackson and James Jackson are not blood related as far as we know. Um, Andrew Jackson was born off on the North Carolina, South Carolina frontier, and James is born in Ireland. But they became somewhat business partners, but from the very start, they had different opinions about how to do things. And we are told from family letters that very quickly they kind of parted ways, not only politically, but economically. And here's a statement I read. James Jackson had the Midas touch. You know what that means? Whatever he touched turned to money. Andrew Jackson did not have that touch. We know he went, he went financially bankrupt twice. We also know that his politics did not agree with James. So when James Jackson comes to Alabama and Alabama becomes a state in 1819, it didn't take long for Lauderdale County to realize we need to put this man in the legislature. So he served in the House first and then in the state Senate. And it didn't take long also when Andrew Jackson ran for president and was elected in 1828 they called themselves the Jacksonian Democrats. This is where the Democratic Party today gets their origin with Andrew Jackson, actually founded in 1824. He, had, he lost that election. So he's elected in 28, reelected in 32. If you opposed him, you were called Whigs. So the Whigs were what is today the modern Republican Party. And James Jackson was the president of the Whig Party in Alabama. So you go from two friends in Nashville to political enemies, politically, and we think economically. He didn't agree with the way Jackson ran the economy. He didn't agree. So they're diametrically opposite, okay? So, and buggies would come around. And by the way, there's a picture. I have a picture we think taken about 1900, and that tree is a very tiny tree, right there. The trees that were here in the picture in 1900 all are dead because of the fire. The fire was so hot that it killed the trees. Um, so you would off offload, enter the house here, and then uh, you went into it immediately into a massive hallway. Here in this corner was the dining room. This corner was the parlor. The back corner was a guest room. And then that back corner over there was the master bedroom. And then there was a staircase. You entered the staircase near the back door. The staircase goes upstairs and the upstairs mimics the downstairs. Four massive bedrooms with a massive center, like a den, if you would. They had he married a woman in Nashville named Sarah Moore McCullough. She, when she married James Jackson, she was 19 years old and already had a child and a widow. 
Her first husband had drowned in a land buying expedition and left her a widow and a young mother. So James Jackson adopts her daughter, Elizabeth, then they will have nine more children, um, eight of which survived um, to, to a full adulthood. And he adopts that daughter, and later that adopted daughter marries James Jackson's nephew, James Kirkman. So the house is resplendent for that time. You can imagine coming out here to a party or coming out here to a, a wedding and you gotta imagine um, how big this house was. In the bedrooms upstairs, when I was growing up here, my great uncle, Rufus Dowdy, owned it. And uh, my parents were kind of the keepers of the house because he lived and worked in Birmingham. He was an engineer and owned a, he owned a civil engineering company. And so uh, plumbing and heating predominantly. And so he would only come up here maybe once a month. So he stayed in the master bedroom here. The rest of the house was just cold, you know, fireplaces. Uh, and you have never cut wood until you try to cut wood for this many fireplaces. Each room had a fireplace and each fireplace consumed wood like an addict. You got to take that wood upstairs. I remember thinking, man, I don't want to do this. So the house was not heated as we would have it heated today. Um, but he did have power in it, had running, had bathrooms in it by that time. And um, it was used by our family for many, many occasions. You know, um, my, my, my aunt was not married here, but her reception was here. My mother said that my sisters would be married here. Of course, that was all ended by the fire. But this house would have been a major palace at that time, 18, 18, 18, 19. In one of the bedrooms, and um, the house was divided up in four bedrooms upstairs, my uncle had four poster beds, four in each room. That's how big they were. And you could sleep, I know this because my sisters had little spend the night parties with their girlfriends, we had 20 girls in one room here one night because each bed had a trundle bed you could pull out and sleep another two or three in each bed. So this was a massive house uh, that probably saw a great deal of social activity. Um, and notice it's isolated. You're five miles from, or really about seven from downtown Florence. And this would have been isolated out here by itself. At the time the family owned the home, they had, um, according to, to records, uh, every year, every 10 years, the census was conducted. They also conducted a slave census. So we know at one time there were 120 plus African slaves here working this plantation. Also, we know that many of the, the names of some of the slaves, like coffee, there were some co names here who we believe were intermarried with Jackson's and the Coffees, and then intermarried with the Hoods over here. Um, and I still haven't come up with that other name, and I will. This is a senior moment. And I'll, I'll remember it tomorrow. Um, but um, to kind of give you a little bit of background about James Jackson and the horses in a second, but does anybody have a question about the house? The meals would be brought in that dining room door right there. Now, all of that was done because fires originated the most frequently in kitchens so if you lost an outside kitchen you could always rebuild it and not have to lose the house so if you ever go to monticello jefferson's home you ever go up to the hermitage jackson's home all the kitchens were outside but when i grew up the kitchen was in that back room back there can you imagine every every summer um, we had an extended family. We had a black family that lived in the cabin that I grew up with that were there today. We're still as close as anybody, but their family farmed, my family farmed, and then another family nearby farmed. And they all had what we call truck gardens. You, the gardens were massive. So my, this kitchen had three stoves in it, three. <laughs> I never did understand. I guess my uncle just liked buying stoves. But when it came time to can and freeze, 
this kitchen was a real hotbed of activity. The women would gather and can and freeze their, their summer crops right in that kitchen. Uh, I have the bell that came from here um, because all of us were working in the fields and they would ring the bell when lunch was ready. You can imagine uh, 10, 15 men, children gathered on this porch eating lunch, finding, trying to find shade. And then we all took a nap before we went back to the field. I don't know, I, I, it's like it was yesterday. I remember sitting on this porch hearing some wonderful stories told by the elder people. So um, there was a lot of great activity here. I, I was not born here. I grew up here and lived here until I was almost uh, three. And then we moved to the house that I grew up in up here, the first house on the right. But my parents lived upstairs and uh, my grandparents lived downstairs. So as a two and three year old, this was a fortress. You know, I, I imagine a nation could run wild in a place like this. So I have great memories here. So any question, any other question about the house itself? Because we're gonna talk a little quickly about the horses. family was interested in horses in Ireland. And we know from records, and, and Curtis Flowers, who is not here, has written a book called The, the, the Thoroughbreds of the Forks of Cypress. And he, I think it's back in print. Linda, is that book at the, on sale down at the? Yeah. It is. You can buy that book down there at the Florence Tourism called The Thoroughbreds of the Forks. After the American Revolution, there was a great concern that thoroughbred horses had been almost killed out. You see, the officers of the British Army and the officers of the American Army rode thoroughbreds. And these thoroughbreds were imported from England. And of course, if you read about these battles that occurred, some of the casualties, or many of the casualties, were the horses. So after the American Revolution, there was a great concern. And then we had the War of 1812, and there's even more concern that the American horse, the thoroughbred, is disappearing. So there began to be a great interest that we need to import more horses from England to breed with horses in America. And one of those men was James Jackson. Now I wanna kinda of give you some dates. He brought his first horse um, named Abiger, a stallion, in 1828. So he's been in this house from 1822, and he orders a horse from England. Now you gotta understand, you just couldn't hop on a plane and fly to England and pick your horse out. So they go through a series of businessmen, probably uh, men in Nashville, then maybe in New York, and then letters to London. This will take a great deal of time, but the horse was located, The Bank transfers were done, and the horse came to New York. And for some strange reason, the horse was killed in a street accident in New York. Uh, and it's weird. And then in 1830, he, he brings in a stallion named Leviathan. And you know, uh, Leviathan is one of those mythological creatures that is so large, gigantic. This horse was named that because he was such a huge animal. He arrived at the Forks, and he came from the Lord Chesterfield of England stables. And in eight years, he, he comes to the Forks. It st stands here at it's a stallion. In eight years, his foals won 92 races worth over $100,000 in 1830, uh, 1830. I looked that up. That's almost a million dollars today. No horse. No horse in America had ever, their descendants had ever done that. So by 1838, everybody in the South knows who this man is. He is a breeder of fine thoroughbreds. He's not satisfied. He brings in a, a, a filly from England, or, or a mare named Gallipade. And it is to this mare that some of these foals are born. But he is also not satisfied because he, he sends an order to England in 1834 for the best horse in Europe. I want the absolute best horse in Europe. That horse was Glencoe. 
stallion. It belonged to King George IV. And so he purchased that horse. Now get this, he purchases the horse unseen for $10,000 cash in 1835. I looked up this morning. The last time I looked it up, and because of inflation, this fluctuated. At one time, it was over 400000 today, and today it says it's between three hundred and 400000 So this is what he spends on a horse that he never saw. It's brought here, and because he has friends and relatives in Nashville, and by the way, he has formed a partnership with his nephew, this Thomas Kirkman, and they are partners, equal partners in the horses. So Kirkman lives in Nashville, and the horse Leviathan stands and stood there. Glencoe comes here. So if you want to breed your mares, you must bring them one to Nashville or to here, and it will cost you $100. And everybody said, what? No one, no one ever charged $100 for a stallion fee, except James Jackson. And he got it because of the background of his horses. So this is a hotbed then of thoroughbred, not racing, but thoroughbred breeding. Many of you have heard, and many of you may have asked, we've heard there was a racetrack here. No, there was a training track here. And we think, I've read, all my life I've heard it was in these bottoms. And I'll tell you why I don't think it was in the bottoms. The state, by the way, that barn is not the original barn. That, the original barn burned in the 30s. The original barn was two and a half times larger than that barn. And we think then the track would have been in that big field behind that went across that road that does not did not exist at that time, in that large plateau. And that's where they would do their training. The races would be held in Memphis, which is already an established racing center in Nashville. And also there was, a, you could, if you wanted to carry your horses, you could go to Charleston. So if you wanted it big money, the match races, you had to go to those places. So, um, we know that Glencoe, and I think this is very interesting, the National Thoroughbred Association, we keep all the records for thoroughbred horses, and by the way, that's housed in Louisville at Churchill Downs. And you, you ought to go because it's a pretty amazing place. But anyway, they... They have done their history and they said the, the most important horses ever brought to America were four, four horses. A stallion named Dolomade, Leviathan, a mare named Gallopade, and a stallion named Glencoe. So out of all the horses ever brought to, from Europe to America, this man owned three of them. That's not a bad, that's not bad. So when it came time to be dominant in the horse breeding business, he's it. Now, to show you how powerful and how wealthy and how important he was, some of his friends in Nashville kept telling everybody that their horses were the best. They had a stallion named Lisboa. And James Jackson basically had had enough, and he simply told his nephew, tell him to put up or shut up, put $5,000 on the table, and we will bet on a horse unborn. That's pretty good. He believed his horses were so good, I'm going to bet five grand on a horse that hadn't even been born yet. When it, when it came time for the race, he took home all the money. Yeah, he whipped them all. And so his stables were famous in Nashville, and his stables were famous here. Now, in 1839, a horse was born here, a filly, whose name is about this long. He named her for a place in Ireland, Giantess of Dumglaw Ditch. I, doubt, I don't even know if he could spell it, but anyway, she is sired here by Glencoe. 
Now, what is so important is this. From, there began to be a, a it's kind of like the national football championship. There began to be this desire that somebody has to be the winner. So there began to be these races that matched horses of the north versus horses of the south. Now, in order to do that, to have the national championship, you got to have playoffs, right? So they would have races in the north and narrow it down to one. Then there would be races in the south, and then you would get one. And then you would meet, and the money would come on the table. We know from history that there were four such races, and the southern horses won all four of them, and they quit doing it. But what's important is James Jackson saw this horse born and never saw her after that. He died in August of 1840. We think he died of complications of malaria and pneumonia. So he was born, I kind of give you, I didn't tell you, but he's born in Ireland and he's only 54 years old when he died. So his nephew, the house at all the property goes to his widow. The nephew, who is his partner in the horses, gets the horses. And according to the will, the horses had to be uh, sold by a certain time. So this wasn't going to go on you know, indefinitely. They had to put the horses up and they would sell them off. In the meantime, this mare, this filly that was born here, won all the races of the Southern Championships in Nashville at Potona Downs, a racetrack. So rather than keeping that long name, they simply named her Potona. And then they would they matched her with a race. Oh, and by the way, when she won that race, won all those races to become the leading horse of the South, she won thirty thousand dollars, which is one point one million today. So this, you know, horse breeding was a big business. So, we know that the match race is set for Long Island, New York. Now, how do you get your horse from Florence, Alabama? Well, she was in Nashville. How do you get her from Nashville to Long Island? They walked her. Yeah, the groom and the jockeys walked her and, you know, trained her and kept her in shape all the way to Long Island, New York. Now, um, she won the race against the horse of the North named Fashion. Over 100,000 people saw that race. The thoroughbred racing record said that's the largest crowd to see a thoroughbred race at that time in history. And uh, they even carried news of the winning of the race all the way by carrier pigeon, passenger pigeon, then to New York. It would be the, they didn't have a telegraph. That's the pigeons bringing the news. In order to win this race, you had to win two out of the three. So they had a match race, and Potona won all first two races, so there never was a third one. For that, she took home $20,000 and a silver cup. That's about 800000 today. So in, in a matter of a year and a half, she's won almost $2 million today, money. Um. By the way, it was 1,300 miles there and 1,300 miles back. And um, eventually, the um, nephew who had took over the horses sold them all off. Glencoe was the last one sold. He was sold to a family in Lexington, Kentucky. And I've been there. There is um, the Great Horse Park in Kentucky where they bury their, their prime horses. And Glencoe is right there. Now, we know this, um, the Civil War comes, and like all officers in the wars before, they wanted to ride the best horses. We know that five horses, descendants of Glencoe and Leviathan, were ridden by generals of the Confederate Army. Nathan Bedford Forrest had one. And General Mosby of um, the Grey Ghost, the famous Grey Ghost, had one. And he was the son of Glencoe, so they also named him Glencoe. He was captured in battle and given to the Union General Philip Sheridan. 
and there is a portrait of Philip Sheridan on Glencoe hanging in t today in the Pentagon. So we know the original Glencoe lived to be, um, about, I think they said he lived to be 24 years old. And I think I had read that he, he sired over 400 folds in his life here. So here's a statement that, that uh, if Curtis was here, that she would make this statement. Every single thoroughbred racing today has DNA from here. Every, not, not some, every single thoroughbred horse alive today has DNA from here. And you can trace it in Louisville. They have all the records. So, any questions? Oh, by the way, a horse named Man of War, horse named Seattle Slough, Secretariat, all come from here. They're the bloodline. The horses never go back here. They, of course, you know, um, during the Civil War, most of these horses wound up in Kentucky so they could be protected and they have never come home. 